Welcome to Healthy Living with Chef AJ, everyone. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is Kathleen de Maison. Dr. Kathleen de Maison, PhD, is the best selling author of Potatoes Not Prozac, the Sugar Addicts Total Recovery Program. She is both a compassionate coach and a social commentator who has taken the concept of sugar sensitivity and transformed the way of looking at the relationship of addiction and food as a healing agent. Kathleen's name has become synonymous with the healing of sugar addiction through nutrition. The genuineness of her vision and the depth at which people have bonded with her message have powered the development of her website at www.radiantrecovery.com into a leading voice of hope and healing throughout the world. In 1998, she set out to build a worldwide community of supportive sharing, pre-visioning the social networking of today. She has empowered hundreds of women and men to collaborate with her in providing support to thousands daily. Please welcome Kathleen de Maison. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here. And, you know, a pioneer is right. You you not only were a pre-visionary, but really in the field that you are, you know, you started your work at, it's now, it's exploding. But you were like one of the first people, if not the first, maybe William Duffy before you, to really take a stand on how sugar is addictive. Yep, that was a, a, a fair number of years ago, and people thought I was crazy. I bet and you they don't think you're crazy they, now. No, <laughs> they don't. Well, well so tell us, you know, because a lot of my listeners, I, I mean, everybody knows the title of your book, and, and it's funny because I think you probably know Dr. Joan Ifland, who wrote Sugar and Flour, How They Make Us Crazy, Sick, and Fat. Yes, of course. She's wonderful. And, and, you know, it's people like you, I think, that made people like her possible with your work. We interviewed her a few weeks ago, and I mentioned to her that I found her book on Amazon. I didn't even know what it was about, but I bought it just based on the title. And being a book author myself, I, we were talking about how important titles are. And you're, I mean, you hooked me at Potatoes Not Prozac. I mean, I don't remember the year it came out, but I was somebody who was on Prozac. And I wanted to jump off a building, and now I'm somebody that's on potatoes and not on any medication. And the title, it's fabulous. How did you think of it? What propelled you to write it? Well, what happened was I was um, running a alcohol and drug rehab, and uh, <clears throat> people just weren't getting well. Treatment basically doesn't work. And I thought, you know, if we were in any other field, we wouldn't stay in business if we were doing that miserably. <laughs> and uh, so, great uh, lie. <laughs> my, my own experience, I um, had uh, changed what I was eating, and I could not believe how differently I felt. It just, you know, by that point, I, I was in my late forties, and I I'd done. Um, self-help and I'd done therapy and I'd done 12-step work and this whole package and I still felt terrible and I felt that it was my fault because if I should know better if I had done all that stuff and I changed what I was eating and all of a sudden everything changed and I thought you know what I wonder if there's something going on with these guys who are not able to stay sober mm. so I started asking them and of course they were all multiple offender drunk drivers, and they, which meant that they were all really uh, serious alcoholics. Everybody ate huge amounts of sugar and no breakfast and no real meals and just junk food. Yeah. So I said, um, just quite innocently, really, you know, will you try an experiment with me? Let's Let's try doing something differently. And I made up a food plan for them, and um, just based on common sense at that point and some just miracles started happening not the least of which was that they started getting sober and staying mm. sober mm. and so after about three years you know I thought something's happening here that's pretty important and I need to write about it and if I'm going to do that I need to have a PhD wow so, um, I was 48 at that point. So I quit my job and I sold my house and I moved into a one room apartment above a garage and I went back to school to find out like what what was the the science behind what I was observing clinically. Mm. And um I love that, that. I love 
I don't mean to interrupt, but I just because the, your your story is is one of recovery, but it's also one of hope because just what you said because a lot of my listeners are women, probably more of them than yeah. than men between the ages of forty. 40 to 60. And a lot of them give up hope with their lives, with their addiction that they're suffering with. And the fact that you went back to school, getting a PhD is not easy in, in, at any age. I, you know, not everybody can do it. And I want everyone to hear that this woman at 48 did what you did. And, and I mean, that to me is just inspiring because I'm a late bloomer too. And yeah. that, that you got a P you went, you started your PhD at 48. And I just want people to, I want to acknowledge you for that and let people hear that because a lot of people don't realize that it is that, that, that to me is just, it's incredible. Well, it is, I think it's also a testament to the fact that I was at that point doing what we call doing the food. That's kind of our, our buzzword. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So that I had the biochemical stability to not be a crazy woman. Yeah. I also had the passion of seeing for three years people get sober and not be depressed and not be crazy who had been thrown away by society. So the, mm. the combination of those two things kind of came together. And I just said, I'm going to put everything that I believe in in sort of all my eggs into this basket because I believe so passionately that this is real, that sugar addiction is real, and that there's a reason for it, and that it's not a moral issue, and it's not that we're bad people or weak-willed. That I knew because I had experienced that myself, and I knew that I wasn't just making it up. Um, I find it so fascinating that you came to it through your work with alcoholics. Now, I, 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 I don't know much about the disease alcoholism. I don't happen to suffer from that particular addiction. But I remember when I was younger, I was a big fan of the show I Dream of Jeannie. Larry Hagman was, uh, mm -hmm. was he played major, uh, the, the astronaut, and later on in Dallas. And I remember reading in the TV Guide a long time ago, he was an alcoholic, and he was on a transplant to get a new liver. And before they would give him a new liver, they, they said, you cannot be drinking. You know, we're not going to give you a new liver if you continue to abuse the liver you have. Mm -hmm. So he was talking about how his, when he, you know, he was not somebody that ever ate candy, really. But he said that once he abstained from alcohol, he just mm -hmm. couldn't stop eating sugar, that he was eating pounds of malted yeah. milk balls a day. And right then I said, wow, there is something to that. Because even growing up, I personally am a recovering food addict, and my, my drug of choice was always sugar for the first 43 years. And I remember, you know, meeting people that, like, they didn't eat sugar. But the people that didn't eat sugar, they always seemed to drink alcohol. Like, it was always, you know, mm -hmm. they one, one or the other. And what you're saying is that the gentlemen you work with that were alcoholics also were abusing sugar. So that's, that, it's kind of fascinating because, you know, historically when you'd go to AA meetings, not that I've been, but people would tell me there's no liquor, but there'd be donuts, you know, so it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, here, here's what's fascinating. Sugar actually evokes the same brain chemical that alcohol does. Wow. And, and, and heroin. Yep. Um, it, and it's a matter of, you know, of, of degree, but if you if you are trying to recover from alcoholism and you use sugar to take the edge off, mm -hmm. which it will, the problem is you'll relapse because you're also keeping all those little receptors on and excited and you know blinking. Sure. Um, the th the thing that was really critical for me was that on some profound level, I understood that there was more to the story than just the sugar. And um, w one of the things that, that, based on what you just said, about this, this issue of food addiction, mm -hmm. I want to I seed an interesting idea that uh, my own sense is that food is the healer. Mm -hmm. And that we're, we're addicted to sugar, we're addicted to fat, we're addicted to white stuff. But food itself is what heals us. And so, so I'm coming at this of a place sort of taking the negative spin off of food so that people can learn to embrace food as a way to heal the brain. Sure. The, the way we get into trouble is people who are vulnerable to this, so sugar-sensitive people. Now, there are a whole group of people for whom sugar has no charge whatsoever. That's because they have brains that are not vulnerable to it. So those people are the ones who say, why don't you just stop? Yeah. <laughs> if it's a problem, why do you keep having it? And 
they don't have a clue. Um, it's uh, or it, if you're trying to lose weight, or if you're trying to stop restricting, they'll say, "Well, why do you eat?" or why don't why don't you just eat? I mean, either one. It's the same. It's the same. Just two sides of the same story. Yeah. And so those people don't have a clue. If you have a sugar sensitive brain, then you feel more deeply, and that's biochemical. This is not. I'm not talking psychology. Right. Because I remember reading in one of your works that that sugar sensitive people are more sensitive to emotions. And I, I don't know yes. if you're familiar with the the work of Dr. Elaine Aaron, PhD, when she talked about the highly sensitive right. person. Because yes. I'm I'm also an HSP. But how does one know? Like I, I've never had children, but like how do you know if somebody is sugar sensitive? If their brain is sugar sensitive or not? Do you just wait and test it? Uh, how well, they react to sugar or I can tell I can tell it with a baby I mean it's it sort of if you have a two-year-old screaming that they have to have soda right now mm. kids who are not sugar sensitive don't do that um, if if a child cries, stops at a, a sparrow that's on the ground that has fallen out of the nest and the child starts crying oh um, that's a, a clue that or for little boys, uh, when I would ask the guys in the treatment center, how many of you were called sissy when you were little? And 100% because they cried when, as little boys. They would cry and they would get into trouble. So that, um, and, and in the book we have these highly scientific tests, like um, if you put sugar on your Rice Krispies and you, when you were little <gasps> and you ate the Rice Krispies and what you really wanted was the sugar at the yeah. bottom of the bowl, I also put chocolate milk too. <laughs> right, exactly. See, and regular people, um, regular people will think that is the most bizarre question they've ever heard. Yeah. Like oh. I didn't like the sugar, you know. I just wanted to eat the cereal, and I just left that sugar glop at the bottom. I... And we're all laughing because. We know that that's why we ate the Rice Krispies. Of course. The, I, the only reason I ever accepted Jello as a dessert was to get the Cool Whip. Right. You know, the whipped cream on top. Oh, exactly. wow. Exactly. So, so the issue, people who are sugar sensitive, no. They yeah. absolutely, now they may not know that it's not a character defect, but they know because they have, they go to a restaurant and what they look at is the dessert menu. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's not normal. <laughs> or they grow up like me, or they grow up like me to be pastry chefs, you know, which exactly. I'm not. I'm not anymore. You know, I, I remember when I was little, Kathleen, like, you know, it was always hard to sit still when like, the few times we'd go out to dinner at a restaurant. So the first thing I'd always do is grab those sugar packets and just yep. put it in my water. Yep. yep. Absolutely. That's... So, you know, I mean, it's sort of, we, we, if we were to have, I've, and I've done this, have a discussion with 50 people in the room. I could start telling the story about the chocolate chip cookies coming out of the oven and, you know, say, and the cookies are sitting on the counter. And the people who are sugar sensitive in the room start laughing because every single one of them is having a physiological I know. reaction. I can see Not that. Not even I... to real cookies, but yeah, to I... the idea, okay. the idea oh my God. of cookies sitting on a plate just out of the oven. I mean, I can actually see right. them and smell them and exactly. taste them. And, yeah. and I haven't had sugar in, in about 12, almost 12 years now. So that's how we tell. Wow. That, that, that is absolutely fascinating. You know, it's so funny because today I actually went to the, my uh, twice yearly checkup at the dentist and I had my teeth cleaned, but he had moved his office to a one now he's sharing with another dentist. And I come into this new office and there's this big glass bowl that says, please have a treat filled with candy. And the candy was caramels. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? And I said, I said, this is unacceptable. I said, you're here to treat people from the effects of having this. And it's, it wasn't even just candy, but can you, caramels so that they can pull out their crowns and their, and their filling. I mean, <laughs> am I the only one that sees something wrong with this picture? Well, it, I mean, to me, it's fascinating that yeah. somebody can be in the profession and not make that connection at all. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is scary. Yeah. Oh, boy. So you could be born with a sugar-sensitive brain, but right. if for some reason you're lucky enough, I, I, you know, I always use my mentor, Dr. Goldhammer, who's never fed his family sugar, but grew up in a family where you just never got it, you don't turn into a sugar addict then. Well, 
or do you? No, sometimes. Okay. Sometimes, um, I think it, it's not quite as simple as that. I think sometimes um, not having it creates a rebound effect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then you feel resentful. And then, you know, it, th- here's the thing, to, to be honest with you. Being sugar sensitive is not a bad thing. What is difficult is the imbalance. So that if you grow up in a household where you're given good food and it's on time and it's enough and you have it at regular intervals and you have fruit and sometimes you have a treat, you know, you have birthday cake, or then it doesn't get activated. Okay. And, um, so it's not just, and this is, again, now that everybody is talking about sugar addiction, and there are you know seven million hits on seven million sites on Google for it, and sugar becomes the enemy. It's sugar, sugar, sugar. It isn't the sugar; it's the imbalance. And so part of the healing process is to create, not be afraid about sugar. If you create the balance, sugar just recedes. It it just it just goes away. And when people, the people that I work with, they don't go off of sugar right away. It's the sixth out of seven steps. So it's almost at the end. Mm. They do all this other stuff and they get to the sugar step and it's a non-issue. Now, these days, a lot of people are coming in and saying, oh my God, I just went off of sugar and I feel like I'm going to die and whatever. And they're doing all this drama stuff. And then we try to calm them down and sort of repair the damage of a sugar detox in one day. And it's very, so it's a very different way of approaching the, the, the solution, which is to just not be such drama queens about it. <laughs> mm, interesting. Because I get a lot of people asking about cravings and if the cravings for sugar ever go away after a certain period of abstinence and recovery. Okay, so that's perfect. the perfect question. Cravings are absolutely related to withdrawal. And when you're in withdrawal from the, the, the brain chemicals that are activated by sugar, when you're in withdrawal, you crave. If you're not in withdrawal because they're being filled up by other things like puppies and music <laughs> and meditation, <laughs> then you don't have – and if you're eating enough and you're eating on time – then you don't have cravings. You just don't have cravings. So cravings are always a sign. Now, for example, if you do something that really spikes up your own beta endorphin, you do something like, I don't know, you you fall in love and you go out and you spend a whole weekend with someone and you're just feeling wonderful and you're in recovery from sugar addiction, four days later you will crave sugar. If you don't understand the biochemistry, you'll think that those cravings are just coming out of nowhere. And if you're talking to people who tell you that there's a four-day neurological process here and that that really was about Saturday night and not about inexplicable cravings just coming out of the woodwork. So, I mean, (laughs) that's kind of um, irreverence and knowledge base that we give people to understand of course the cravings go away. That's the whole point of being in recovery is Ab- that you're not ab- tormented. Absolutely, absolutely. So so I guess the take-home message is don't fall in love then? No, I'm just kidding, of course. No, the take-home <laughs> message is if you fall in love, know what to do on <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> which would, is, yeah, which is it, Or fall in love after you've gotten your brain settled. Yeah. Because once your brain is settled, you, you don't have that kind of reaction anymore. Well, but, you know, I love what you're talking about with the brain because Dr. Islan said the same thing, that the goal is to stabilize the brain chemistry. Now, could you please, because most of us aren't PhDs on this call, what, what do you mean by beta endorphin and how does that play a role? Okay, so your brain has different chemicals that are there to do different things. So serotonin, for example, is there to help you say no. Mm. Impulse control, that's what serotonin is for. So, for example, people who restrict have very high levels of serotonin. They know how to say no really, 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 really well. People who have very low levels of serotonin uh, can't say no. It's like they say, I'm not going to eat the cookie, I'm not going to eat the cookie. Cookie jumps in their mouth. So that's 
Well, that they that actually does happen. I've actually seen that happen. Cookies yeah. actually do jump. Right. They and, do. And, but what's even more interesting is they actually know how to open the freezer door and get out of the freezer before right. they jump in your mouth. It's amazing <laughs> how, how well they're training them these days. That's the serotonin. The serotonin <laughs> is that's part of the story. So beta endorphin is there to um, take care of pain. It's the brain chemical that is a there it does two things. It stops pain, so it's a, what's an analgesic, it's an anesthetic, mm-hmm. and it also is an amnesiac. So when you have high levels of beta endorphin, you, it not only stops pain, but it makes you forget it. So it's kind of like what happens in childbirth for a okay. lot of people. Okay. Sure. You have intense pain, and then you you don't remember, and that is biochemical. Well, sugar and alcohol evoke that, that chemical. So the chemical is there in your brain. People who are sugar sensitive have lower levels of that chemical. So we feel pain more deeply, literally. I mean, like go to the dentist, it hurts more. Oh, my gosh. I I, I mean, I'm almost 55, and I have to get gas just to get my teeth cleaned. And anesthetic. Right. Wow. That's exactly what it is. Now, it's not just feeling physical pain more. Emotional pain. Emotional pain. Yes. So what we learn early on is that if we're using sugar, we don't hurt as much because it literally is a painkiller. Yes. Well, well, they always give it to be, There's a wonderful uh, YouTube by Dr. Neil, Barda, Neil Barnard of PCRM called How to Magnetize a Baby. And just giving them a little sugar water, that kid will just look at you and love right. you. and yeah. Well, this is part of the, the research that had been done just before. The, the only research that had been done when I started my PhD, the only research that had been published was um, by Elliot Blass, who was using sugar to anesthetize babies before circumcision. Right. Well, you know, a lot of times they'll do wine, but alcohol is basically sugar. That that mm-hmm. is just uh, yeah. That is fascinating. So that that was where we we started off with this, and then they tested little mice, and this is how they found out that sugar was. Um, uh, how that it affects beta endorphin, they test the little mice and they they had a hot plate and they put the little mm. mouse foot on the hot plate. It wasn't super hot. It was just oh, good, good. And hot enough that the mouse would pick its foot up and they, they would measure how long it took the mouse to pick its foot up. It was called paw lift latency. This is what you learn when you get a PhD. <laughs> to say things like that. Okay, so they measure how long the paw lift latency was. Then they gave the mice the little mice sugar, and the the mice left their feet uh, there longer. Now, and they weren't getting burned. It's not bad. It's just sure. they had more tolerance for pain. It didn't hurt as much. Well, what they did was then they gave the little mice uh, naltrexon, which is a, a drug that blocks heroin. It's not a. They didn't know at that point mm-hmm. that it was a sugar blocker. They they knew that it blocked beta endorphin. And um, so they gave the mouse the mice sugar, and then they gave them naltrexone, and the sugar had no effect. So that's when they learned that sugar was affecting part of the brain, the same part of the brain that's affected by heroin or um, alcohol. Yeah. And, and so that's how we sort of first learned the power of sugar. Now, people who are sugar addicts absolutely know that this is a drug. It's a drug substance. And it hurts to try to get off of it, and it can be blinding when people talk about cravings. They're talking about the blinding impulse to use something that they know is not good for them. That's addiction. Yeah, and that's drug addiction. Yep, yep. Yeah, it, it it seems like you know it, finally this research is being is is, is catching up because William Duffy wrote Sugar Blues in the '50s and basically right, right. said a lot of this. Right. And, and you know the, these these processed food industries they're so powerful and they don't want us to know the truth about this but it's getting out now and you would think that somebody I don't know who that somebody is would do something about it that that like just like we have warnings you know it, it's not against the law to smoke 
we know it's bad for you. People still choose to do it, but there's labels that say the Surgeon General has determined smoking is hazardous to your health, especially if you're pregnant. People can drink alcohol, but there's, you know, we know that. Why should why why isn't there a warning label on every piece of processed food that contains sugar? Well, here here's an interesting thing. The consumers are shaping that issue. If you why is Coca Cola now making cans? that are eight ounces, half size cans. Because of Mayor Bloomberg? <laughs> well, because consumers are talking to each other and are getting that this is a problem. So that, in fact, if I look at what's happened in the last two years, that there is a huge cons- consumer shift about sugar levels. And it used to be that the standard you know, the sugar level in soda kept going up and up. It went up from, you know, uh, 25 grams to 49 grams of sugar per can. Well, in the last two years, it's going down, and now they'll say it's a combination of sugar and stevia. And so, you know, in some ways they're saying, oh, this is less sugar, but the informed consumer knows that the taste if the taste of the sweet is equivalent uh-huh. to 49 grams of sugar, you'll still get a brain response regardless of what it's coming from. Right. So p- people who go off of sugar and say, oh, I'm using stevia, it's fine. No, it's and, not fine. So, please please tell, you know, that was going to be one of my later questions, but since you brought it up, there are so many people that come to me through other programs that say, you know, they, they acknowledge that sugar is deleterious and they say there's no sugar in this program, but then they'll give them things like erythritol and stevia. And everybody that comes to me from these other programs says I could, they cause so much cravings. I couldn't stop overeating the food right. that was in it. So So please talk a little bit about these non-caloric so-called healthier sweeteners. Okay, so there's there's I put them into two categories. One is the chemical ones. The chemical ones are horrible for you no matter what. Right. So That's like things exactly. like right. yeah. NutraSweet and and um Splenda. Mm-hmm. Like they're just bad for you and I don't even want to waste the time saying why and if somebody wants to know, you can come on my website and I'll tell you in detail. But Sure. If you look at the ones that are that are being marketed as natural and therefore good for you, mm-hmm. um, from a diabetic point of view, that is true. Something like stevia. Now, the sugar alcohols, the ones that end in OL, yeah, they're they're alcohol, and so they're not good for you. But exactly. stevia is stevia is an herb that tastes sweet, so it doesn't have calories and it doesn't change your blood sugar. But if you're a sugar addict, it keeps all the beta endorphin receptors wide awake and looking for more. Mm-hmm. And so it's the last thing in the world you want to do. And what I say to people is just have sugar until you're ready not to. Mm-hmm. Because if you start using all that stuff, it fools you into thinking that it's okay. And it really just makes you more crazy. Whereas if you're having sugar, at least you know that you're yeah, you know what you know. What, it reminds me. Here's tell me what you think of this analogy. Like, getting off sugar and going on to like erythritol or stevia is sort of like quitting smoking and then just doing your cigarettes through vapor. <laughs> That's you know, an interesting thought. Yeah, you're just changing your drug. Yeah, you're you're changing the delivery mechanism. So maybe doing these vapor cigarettes is a little bit better for your lungs because you're not burning them. You're still you're still addicted to the nicotine and all the other chemicals, you know. Right, so. you're still, exactly. Yeah. Now, I mean, but again, when I'm talking to people, what I say is, look, stop thinking about sugar or sweet and start thinking about breakfast. Yeah. And people really resist that. It's like, oh, that's so boring. And I say, that's the point. That we're trying to treat drama queenism. Mm. And addiction is about being a drama queen or a drama, drama king. Yeah. And if you have, if you focus on breakfast, like what you give your energy to is what's going to grow. So if you focus on sugar, then you're going to be thinking about cravings. You're going to be thinking about binging. You're going to be thinking about <clears throat> what to do or what not to do. Whereas if you start thinking about breakfast, then you're going to learn how to cook. And you're going to learn how to pay attention to time. And you're going to learn how to 
feed yourself well or to have, you know, to make a shake that tastes really good. So you start switching off the addictive patterns. Yeah. Which That's is very exciting, actually. And um, you, I read that you wrote that, um, that the, you, what you believe that exercise is wonderful because it actually builds these beta endorphins without spiking it and creating cravings. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, most exercise, some exercise. Now, if you take an addict, yeah, they can create cravings with almost anything, including exercise. Interesting. <laughs> so, you know, if you if you go to the gym and you do spiky exercise or addictive exercise, then you'll have cravings. And well, well what you, it, could you explain what you mean by spiky exercise, like like something? Oh, too I don't know. Going on the treadmill for sixty minutes. Mm. You know, uh, and doing it every day, not resting. I got or it. Like lifting obsessive. weights. Obsessive, yeah, obsessive, obsessive. obsessive exercise, sure. Yeah. Yeah, or exercise that is intense and you sweat and you get all spiked up and you don't rest and you do that every single day. Sure. So that you, you're not like healthy exercise pushes you, <clears throat> gets your muscles to grow, helps you feel relaxed. And then resting allows you to uh, repair your muscles and, you know, get stronger because re the rest time is when you get stronger. And so that the process, like learning how to be in recovery is learning how to do the food, but also learning how to live so that you're not always getting yourself into trouble. You're not always over the edge. You're not always doing dramatic things. Mm. So that I would imagine then for us drama queens, things like meditation it would, and prayer and affirmations, these would probably be good things for our brains. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. That, that's what I'm, I'm actually working on this year. You know, it's funny because before I became a chef and an educator, my job most of my life was working at retirement homes with mm -hmm. senior citizens. I was an activity director. Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting because the, the people that were sugar addicts, like in their to, – to the, and some of them were over 100 – they looked different than the ones that weren't. And yeah. I, and, 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 and they were wrinkly. Like, like I know like when people smoke, they get all wrinkly in their skin, yeah. you know, yeah. and the people that were sugar addicts, even people in the hundreds, it's not that everybody necessarily gets wrinkly when they're old. Some do, some don't. They, they were, they looked like smokers. Whereas the people that really weren't sugar addicts, their skin looked better. They, they were, their physiology, they, they just looked different. What they, an incredible it, observation. Yeah, I mean, and that's it really, yeah. <clears throat> that's, you know, people say to me all the time, well, how old are you anyway? And they can't believe that I'm old, you know, on <laughs> old part. And, yeah. and I think it's because, you know, I, yeah. I don't eat addictively. I don't, um, you know, I'm not in that process anymore. It, you know, it really does, you know, the, the, the outside, it, the inside reflects the outside because mm -hmm. I'll be 55 in a couple months. I've been off sugar and abstinent for almost 12 years now and flour, not quite as long. And I, I wear makeup only when I, you know, when I'm speaking professionally and people are like, oh my God, your skin's so good. And I'm like, yeah. what? I mean, like, yeah. I, I, I don't do anything, you know, except that I eat the proper foods like fruits and vegetables. And, yeah. you know, and it's, it's amazing just for, for us, us vain people, how, how that makes, uh, makes a huge difference. Well, you know, we can't have a conversation with you without talking about potatoes, not Prozac. That was just such a groundbreaking book. And did the title just come to you one day while taking a bath or how did that that come about pretty much yeah it, it, it's just I mean because you just I mean you I, I, it's like it's one of those titles Kathleen I just want to see the movie and I'm just so happy because potatoes are a complex carbohydrate that have been vilified for far too long and now with the rise in the paleo diet they're vilified and I find the potatoes were not only the answer to, to, that helped me finally lose weight of course it, it was treating the addiction of course but they, they, they really are so wonderful for at least my brain chemistry and all all of my clients you know the, the longest lived people in the world are the okinawans and they eat almost 72 percent of their calories from sweet potatoes and i find that potato is really almost the perfect food well i i this is very interesting because you know in, when I wrote Potatoes Not Prozac, I chose potatoes because they seem to have, first of all, because they're widely available, they're cheap, they make you feel really satisfied, and because I'm Irish, you know, <laughs> all Irish people eat potatoes, 
but they weren't bad yet. <laughs> you know, it was before they were bad, so we could, um, you know, say that with, with impunity and nobody was on my case. But the reality is that potatoes are very good for you. They're, they're high in potassium. They have a lot of wonderful nutrients in them. And if you're having, they, they, they produce this serotonin effect that literally, I mean, I have people who say, you've got to be kidding me. And I'll say, no, you know, you try this. After you get to this point, you do step four and you have a potato three hours after dinner and see what happens to your sleep. And they just can't believe it. They can't believe yeah. that something like that. Um, you know, now I think that pushing the edge, I mean, this is what we've learned since then, is that sweet potatoes are wonderful. They are they're my absolutely, favorite. Absolutely, they're like a wonder food. And so if someone is pre-diabetic, for example, or their blood sugar is vulnerable to um, <clears throat> now the, the uh, diabetic part of potatoes is white potatoes without skin and without butter. With skin and butter, it slows it down. And what potatoes do, it's, it's almost like they, re they cause a reaction, an insulin reaction, that's ideally suited for creating deep sleep. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there's, there's really a chemical process that happens that um, is so much more efficient even than antidepressants. So when I wrote the book, we, we were really interested in the whole issue of antidepressants because at that point it's just when people, uh, medical professionals, were prescribing them for women for anything. You know, it's kind of like sure. uh, it was just inappropriate. Yep. And so it's sort of like here's something that you can do. You can adjust the dose. You can, you know, have a little potato. You can have a big potato. You can have a sweet potato. There's all sorts of self, um, really it's self-direction that you can't do with medication. You can't play around with it. But with a potato, you, there's all sorts of things you can do. And people love finding what we call the sweet spot of your potato, <laughs> which is how big is it. And, you know, because if you have too much, you'll get hallucinogenic dreaming. Um, you know, when people take hallucinogens, that's activating, overactivating serotonin. So if you have a huge potato, you'll have very vivid dreams. And so, you know, you can watch your dream state and have it guide you. I mean, it's really on some level one could call it very spiritual to have your dreams guide you to what is the right level of that nutritional intervention. So, again, this is looking at the idea of food as healer, that potato becomes your friend and your guide. Well, they I are. I mean, literally. Yeah. <laughs> they are my friend. You know, I'm going to be interviewing a, a sleep doctor very soon on this show, and I'm going to suggest to him that instead of writing prescriptions from Ambien, he starts writing prescriptions for potatoes. Yeah, he... <laughs> You might that might be a little provocative, now. but but um, do, you, do you just 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 as a just just girl to girl? Do you have a favorite type of potato? Mine is the purple ones from Hawaii. I love Yukon Gold. Me too. Oh my God, yeah. that that I love those too. We make waffles out of them. Let me tell you a yeah. great recipe, Kathleen. In case you haven't heard about it, you take a waffle iron and you, we get the nonstick kind, twenty bucks at Bed Bath and Beyond mm -hmm. the Teflon. You plug it in. You take your Yukon Gold. You try to get one that's about three or four ounces because if it's too big. It won't work. And this recipe, by the way, is from Sandy Pluis from Australia. She's a blogger. And mm -hmm. then you cook it however you cook it, microwave it, bake it, steam it. And then you put that in the squares of the waffle iron. You press down for five or six minutes, and you get these amazing waffle buns. Cause I, and, and I use them, like, for buns on my, on my bean burgers because I don't eat gluten or bread. And they're mm -hmm. crunchy, and they're fun, and you can dip them in things and put salsa on them. And they're called waffle potatoes. And you do that with Yukon Gold, and they're just fantastic. Oh, that is a great idea. I'm going to well, tell 
tell everybody in our community. Right, and what I'll do is I'll email you the link to the blog so that you can actually see the picture and how to make oh. it. And, and it's it's just a really fun way to eat potatoes. And we, we eat Yukon Golds all the time, and we stuff them with black beans and corn and salsa, and my husband puts some guacamole. We So Yukon Gold is my favorite non-sweet potato. I, I'll tell you that. They're just, I, I love this idea. Yeah, well, well, but you came to the right place. I'll send you my book because it's called Unprocessed, and on the cover actually is a potato. So, so we are we are in definite uh, uh, agreement of our our love for potatoes. The sisterhood of potatoes. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Why not? Um, you know, it's funny because you were talking a little earlier about uh, evoking beta endorphin, and I believe you said that the fat and nuts also invoke invokes beta endorphins. Fat? Did I say fat? Yes. I thought you uh, not not today, but in, I was reading. You know, I was rereading some of your stuff because yeah. because I find that as a food addict in recovery, that that I had a real big problem with nuts, and that was something that I just had to eliminate from my diet because I was turning to those when I you know I stopped the sugar, but then mm-hmm. you know like most addicts, we don't always necessarily overcome our addiction. We just ch- change it for another one, and so <laughs> so <laughs> you, you haven't heard that one before, have you? No, we we call it the addiction amoeba. Oh boy, it will just slip on over to something else. Exactly. Well, you you know, it says that you have a degree in addictive nutrition. What is that? I mean, that sounds like something. If I was going to say, if I wasn't so old, I would like what what that sounds fascinating to well, me. Well, you're not so old. That's I crazy. Know. I know. I'm just kidding. But I was just after. Uh, that. What does that mean? That means food is healer. Oh. I mean, that really is using using nutrition to heal addiction. That is so cool. And, uh, you know, it was um, when I I actually have the first degree that was ever awarded in that, and Joan has right right after that, her her degree came after that. She has a, a degree in addictive nutrition. Um, my faculty uh, committee said, what is that? <laughs> just like you just asked me. Well, because I don't know where to get it. I'd like one. I, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I have to say this right now because I'm so inspired. And sometimes, because I'm a spiritual person too, and I believe sometimes if you say stuff out in the universe, you can actually get it. But what I just talking to you, I got chills because what I have in, am so inspired to do right now. You don't probably know this about me, but I've produced. 13 live events in California called Healthy Taste of LA. I'm the creator of this event and one of the co-producers. And I just had this vision of creating a seminar, maybe in person if it's possible, because y'all live in different states, but if not, maybe online. You, Dr. Joan Islan, Nancy Appleton, and Kay Shepard. That would be like the dream team. And could you imagine like getting like, you know, like 500 people in an auditorium and teaching the stuff that you guys know? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is and and the the joy is that you can you can get 500 people in an auditorium or you can get you know 20,000 people online simultaneously. Well, I mean, I'm going to do that because don't know anybody out there steal my idea because I want to be the host and the moderator because these are like really the four women pioneers in this field and and I just think that would be so amazing. Because people are, they need to hear this stuff. I mean, I think, I think intuitively, you know, they know it. But like you say, you know, it's just like no smoker wants to stop smoking. I don't think uh-huh. any sugar addicts, you know, you know, you know what it is. It's like I, I find that I find addicts, you know, because I am one. It takes one to know them. I find them so humorous because it's, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, they come to me for help with food addiction for sugar addiction. And then, I, of course, I, you know, they don't like the answer, which eventually is going to be abstinence. You know, they, they don't seem to like that concept at all. And I say to them, it's like what you're saying to me then, it's like I'm your doctor and you have lung cancer and you're coming to me and saying, well, you know, what would be the best type of cigarette for me to smoke now that I have lung cancer? You know, and it's, it's, it's just so funny how, um, you know, I don't know. It just, it just makes Okay, me- so I'm going to push you on this, though, because this is I'm coming from – a slightly different perspective on this, and this okay. is I'm going to nudge you. I just, I just talked to Joan about this last week, and I know I did the same thing with her, and I said, look, I want to talk about abundance, not abstinence. Okay. I want to talk about what what the kind of joyful food that we can have, rather than focusing on what we can't have. Sure. And here you are, you're a chef, and you know how to to do something like. Make a waffle out of a potato. And, you know, <laughs> people, people who are not, usually people who are addicts don't really know how to cook. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so my pitch is 
let's move out of the idea of abstaining and start thinking about what is the abundance of the kinds of foods that that we eat in recovery. And, I love it. I and love how it. food becomes the solution and that we're not afraid about food. It's not food that's the problem. Food is what heals us. That what the problem is is the substances that we use as drugs. So it's the drugs, not the food itself. And that that we that you are part of this this vision of cooking and the joy of bringing, you know, you're in California, and the joy of the uh, the abundance of the kinds of foods that you can get in California. Sure. That um, that you can be teaching. I mean, I can teach the brain chemistry, and you can be teaching the food and the the joy of the food and the abundance of the food, and you know, like just what you how excited you got me about potatoes <laughs> they're not the enemy and we're not abstaining from scary things that are going to catch us if we if we don't record our our you know daily portions if we start focusing on what can we be cooking that is so good yes what, what kind of vegetables that are so tasty and let's put butter on them because it tastes wonderful well. <laughs> you know, that kind of passionate caring that you have and the passionate relationship to food as a healing agent is what gets me really excited. Mm. And, you know, that's what I want other people to be hearing about the joy of kale. You know, <laughs> I, mean, it's, I love it's, it. It's really, I, I have this kale salad that I make that is, Kale and cashews and orange, um, it's an orange vinaigrette. That sounds delicious. And it's so wonderful. There I am eating kale and loving it. Yeah, yep. it's amazing that, but, you know, I know we, we're not supposed to talk about abstinence, only abundance right now, but it's amazing that when you are abstinent, how good something like kale actually does taste. I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to let you off the hook. Oh no! I'm going to retrain your brain. <laughs> it's like use the term recovery because recovery. it's different. Abstinence is negative. Abstinence okay. means I can't have. Recovery means I'm choosing. Recovery. Okay. I'm choosing a life that is abundant and full. Okay. And thank so, you. No, I appreciate that because I do think language is really, really important. So I am going to, I am going to change. I mean, thank you for catching me and I'll, I'll look at some of the things I've written and and even change it in, in some of my written things because I do, I like the idea of a positive more, more than a negative, you know? Well, if, if you have a, a spiritual, if you have a, here, I'm going to give you the brain, the re, brain spirituality of this. We have in our amygdala, which is our most primal brain, there's a joy side and there's a fear side. And if you're in the fear side, there are a couple of little joy receptors in the fear side. And and abstinence, I think, lives on the fear side of, okay. oh, my God, here's what I can't have. If you move over to the joy side in the amygdala, there are no fear receptors in the joy side. Wow. They just don't exist. And to me, that's what recovery is about, is that there's no fear there that is it's being guided by the universe or grace or however we define that, and all of us can have different definitions, we define that as what what pushes us into loving what we're eating and not being afraid that a craving is going to come because we're having such a good time and we love what we're eating. Yeah. Well, if I had met you sooner, my book would have been called The Joy of Kale. Let me tell you. <laughs> that That's a great well, title. Well, ne- maybe you're... My next one. Yeah. This can be that too. <laughs> That's terrific. One of the things I read that you wrote is that some sugar sensitive people go for alcohol, some for bread or cereal, popcorn, <laughs> or if you're like me, all of the above. So, so what is the connection between those those things? Is it just because they're they're just refined forms of of carbohydrates? No, it's because of the beta endorphin effect. Oh. So they all evoke beta endorphin. Mm-hmm. All of them. Alcohol is the most potent. Right. Um, and then um, straight sugar and then carbohydrates, uh, simple carbohydrates that convert, white things convert into 
a sh sugar, we respond to them as if they were sugars. So even popcorn, even air pop popcorn will convert like that that quickly? I don't think popcorn does. Popcorn is whole grain. Okay, popcorn, I don't know why. Okay, but 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 like but a but a processed cereal maybe might or or, or bread for sure, right? Bread for sure. Yeah, bread for and sure. And then we get into the whole wheat thing. Like I I I think an awful lot of people you know, wheat evokes beta endorphin. Mm -hmm. And so you could have a beta endorphin drug effect from wheat um, that, I mean, it's it's kind of ironic that, that wheat can be m whole wheat and um, can be more problematic than something that is not wheat that looks whiter. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I'm saying about the joy of discovering if you want more of it, and all you're doing is thinking about it, it's probably activating your beta endorphin receptors. Because we hear so much about dopamine these days. Does this have anything to do with any of this? Well, when you <laughs> we hear so much about dopamine because scientists are all testing dopamine because it's easier to find and prod into, and it's where all the money is. But, uh, you know... In another 10 years, people are going to be doing the beta endorphin story. Wow, you're really a pioneer. You've got to, you've got to stay around a long time ago. So you <laughs> oh, I'm going to. Stuff. Oh, no, I, I, I'm glad. You, you, you know, what? okay, I, it seems to me, and, and because you have so much experience working with alcoholics, I, I, one of the things you said at the beginning about how we're doing miserably at treating this disease, and if we were any other type of business, we'd be out of business. Mm -hmm. Now, that's stick with me for a long time but it seems to me and correct me if I'm wrong that that there's a lot of relapse in the treatment of alcoholism and there seems to be a lot of treatment and recovery from food addiction or sugar addiction yeah. and so my question is is what can I as a as a coach as a as an educator do to help my clients especially because okay I understand like it's beginning it's difficult there's withdrawal symptoms and detoxification which you said that's what the cravings actually are is the withdrawal but it, it makes me so sad, and, and you've heard of this in alcohol, you know, alcohol treatment too, when somebody's had a really long recovery mm -hmm. and then they relapse. It, it, you know, it makes me think of the actor Philip Seymour Hoffman, 24 years off of heroin, one drink, boom, he's dead. So can you talk a little bit about relapse and, and relapse sure. prevention? Um, okay, first of all, the people that I was treating, we had a 92% recovery rate. Holy because mackerel. what we did was we added the food component to, to AA, basically, and treatment, which is, you know, self-awareness. But what happens, what I see now all the time, because I work with alcoholics who come to us and I say, do the food and get your brain balanced and you won't relapse. If you're it, Now, not just the food, but if you put together AA and doing the food, and you get a balanced brain and you get something like um, a 12-step program that teaches you how to be a grown-up and teaches you how to not be a brat and take responsibility and do all the things that you didn't learn to do because you were drinking, um, sort of life skills. So if somebody comes to you who has had a problem with alcohol and you add in the kind of nutrition stuff that we're talking about and they learn how to eat, they won't have cravings. The people that I work with, they go off of alcohol. They don't have cravings. They don't have withdrawal. I mean, it's very minimized because we we treat that with food. Mm -hmm. And you can literally, you know, have someone be eating bananas when they're coming off of alcohol instead of, you know, lots of sugar stuff. Mm -hmm. And they they won't have they won't have withdrawal. Now, I was going to ask you how you felt about fruit because, you know, some of the people in this field think some of the high sugar fruits are not so favorable. But I think anytime you get away from sugar, it's a good thing, even if it's eating a date. Well, I, I think dates are pretty intense. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, you know, understanding what, what is the sugar effect of what kind of fruit it is and how it's prepared. So I probably wouldn't eat dates because if I had dates, I would want more. Sure. Um, but berries, strawberries, blueberries, um, you know, and I, I like fruit. I think I don't suggest that people have no sugar whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I think fruit is like a safety net Yeah. that creates uh, a, a way for your brain not to be hypersensitive 
so that you all of a sudden you know you some some sugar comes to you and you're in a hypersensitive reaction that's not a good thing but if you're you know if and and for example I re- just read this article that people who are having an apple a day have the same protection against cholesterol that people using statins. Wow, that's And I was better. just blown away when I read that. And I thought, you know, I think apples are really good. <laughs> and so, yeah, and they're a lot cheaper than statins and have no none of the side effects. No side effects whatsoever. Um, so it's really learning. I think we're all learning the, the shared knowledge that all of us are doing together. We're learning how to chart this new territory in a way that's joyful and not fearful and not reactive and sort of asking these questions in a way that gets us excited and we're sharing. You know, you get excited about kale and you tell me about (laughs) potato waffles and I'm going to go back and, you know, tell all the people who get my newsletter, like, look, let's try this recipe and see what you think. That's when it becomes joyful and we're not afraid. And, you know, like if you try something, and this happens to me, (laughs) I'll try something, and I just think it's wonderful, and I just want more. And then I find out, yeah, well, that's because it's got wine in it. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. You know, so we just kind of, we're learning how to do it in a way that's really helpful. You know, I believe you've written four books. I've only read two of them, but one of my favorite of the two I've read, well, they're both my favorite, is Little Sugar Addicts. Mm-hmm. And I recommend that to all my parents with children because, boy, we, we are really creating a nation of them. Americans eat over 150 pounds of sugar per person per year. That's about a half a pound a day. That's 900 calories of no fiber, no nutrients, of junk, basically. Yep. It's it's It's, it's crazy, huh? It's crazy, and and I think that, you know, Little Sugar Addicts is a book whose time has not come yet. It will, because it's way scary for parents to try to deal with that. They just they don't know how. Yeah. And they get really overwhelmed by it. But, um, you know, I think that's where the story is going next. So bless you for passing that on. Sure, uh, that's that's one of my top of my recommended lists, especially for people with parents. But do you think, Kathleen, it would be possible to have these Little Sugar Addicts if they didn't come from the big sugar addicts because I really don't know any parents that eat healthily without, you know, including sugar that have, you know, raised these little sugar addicts. Well, the little sugar, it's it's genetic. It, it is genetic, okay. And, you know, and the thing is, if you, what I see now is parents who are in recovery, what's happening with their children, and the kids are so excited. They don't feel deprived. They don't feel as if they're weird. They don't feel as if they can't have things. They get all excited about things like making waffles for yeah, potatoes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, it's funny. I used to, as a side job when I was uh, going to college, I used to drive children around. I used to pick them up at school mm-hmm. because their parents would be working, you know, at 3 o'clock and take them home. Yeah, yeah. And and I had, you know, several different children in my car, and they were, you know, very, they were about junior high school age. And uh, or a little bit younger, and the parents would give them money, and with the parents' permission, I would take them to Seven Eleven on the way home for a treat, you know, which would usually be something like a Slurpee or, or uh-huh. flaming yeah, Cheetos yeah. or candy. And what would be so interesting is, and this was many, many years, this was over 20 years ago now, and I was still a sugar addict myself, but I noticed that when I picked these kids up from school, they were they were quiet, they were polite, and then we'd stop at Seven Eleven, and then they would ingest these substances and they would literally turn into maniacs and monsters and it would it would happen so quickly their yep. behavior would change mm-hmm. yeah it was it was fascinating to watch so I, I one of the things i love that i read about you is it said that let me find it i just hallmarked is it that you you had run this treatment center and for alcoholism and drug addiction and that you it caused you to realize that you just didn't want to teach recovery, that you also wanted to have it. I thought that was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? I got so busy talking to you. I forgot to ask the one question that came all the way from the Netherlands. So I do have to ask this before I let you go. And it's, um, let's see, it's like, After lunch and supper, I need to eat something sweet. I usually eat one or two bananas after a very big lunch. 
or some toast with jam or dried fruit after supper. The problem is I start feeling sleepy and less energetic after lunch if I eat those bananas, and it's very hard to stop at one or two toasts with jam after supper, and it slows my weight loss down quite a bit. But I really need my sweet fix. Otherwise, I have the feeling of not being satisfied. Barely, very rarely can I manage not to eat the sweet stuff, but it's hard not to. Is it something I lack maybe, or is it just an addiction? The... Um taste of sweet actually turns on feeling satisfied. Mm. So it, the switch that says I'm finished and I've had enough is turned on by the, the, the it's a serotonin switch. It gets turned on by that the society switch. And so um, what you could do is work with that and have a half a banana rather mm-hmm. than two and sort of titrate it down as if, it, you know, like do a little reduction of your drug there. And um, I don't think I would use toast with jam. Mm-hmm. I would use a potato. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And a sweet potato especially because sweet potatoes are sweet. I mean, they They're taste sweet. Like- and if you put cinnamon and butter on it, you'll think you died and went to heaven. <laughs> Oh, boy. So if people want to get in touch with you or find out more about your work, well, they everyone should read, you know, Potatoes, Not Prozac. It's still a classic. And Little Sugar Addicts, if they have kids or if they're around kids, they go to www.radiantrecovery.com. And what kind of services do you offer? Well, we offer, um, we have a whole group of support lists, online e-lists. We have a community forum, and I teach a whole lot of classes. Uh, most of most of what we do is um, free. Some of it, the classes, there's a, a fee for them. But we have people from all over the world talking to each other, and uh, it's very um, supportive. And I uh, respond to you know if you write me, I'll respond to you directly. Yes, you do, and thank you. <laughs> um, it's kind of you know I wanted to build a community, and that's what we've done, and and that was the vision all those years ago, was to really have a healing community. This was before social media or anything like that, and we have that now. And so there's this, you know, there are people in Europe and people in England and Ireland all and Australia and Malaysia and Nepal, <laughs> Tibet, mm. all talking to each other. And you might find somebody who is in Southern California talking to somebody who lives in the Netherlands, and they just absolutely have the same story so wow it's a very exciting way for people to get support we have a parents list and we have a list for people who are depressed and we have a list for people who are um, dealing with issues of restriction and you know not eating as a solution so there it's a, a wide range of um, resources for people it sounds fascinating. You really are a visionary. And thank you so much for your work because your work has inspired so many people to, to follow in your footsteps and really learn the, you know, the truth about these things that, that are kind of have been hidden from us for so many years. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Kathleen. The guest tonight was Kathleen de Maison, author of Potatoes Not Prozac. You can find out more about her and her wonderful work at www.radiantrecovery.com. And to all of you listening live or listening on the recording, thank you so much for listening to Healthy Living with Chef AJ. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy, taste delicious. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Kathleen.